This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. In 1879, when Richard Strauss was 15 years old, he and his family took a hike to the top of the Heimgarten in Upper Bavaria. They walked for 12 hours before they even got started going up, before dawn. They took a wrong turn on the way down, got stranded by a violent thunderstorm, and finally made it back to their inn after dark. Strauss related his adventures in great detail in a letter to his friend Ludwig Tfila, who had also become a prominent composer, and Strauss included this P.S. The next day I described the whole hike on the piano, naturally huge tone paintings and smarminess a la Wagner." End quote. Not a terribly flattering description, but not too distant from an idea that he would return to over 30 years later. In the meantime, in 1900, Strauss wrote to his parents that he was thinking of composing a tone poem that would begin with a sunrise in Switzerland, he said. Otherwise, so far only the idea, love tragedy of an artist, and a few themes exist. Now, the tone poem was not really a new idea. Franz Liszt had essentially invented it in the 1840s, and other composers like Dvorak, Tchaikovsky, Saint-Saëns, and Franck had written single-movement works based on non-musical sources. But no other composer had made the tone poem his signature the way Strauss had. Don Juan, Till Eulenspiegel, Also Sprach Zarathustra, Don Quixote, and Ein Heldenleben had defined Strauss's career. His great operas were still in the future. In his earlier symphonic poems, Strauss had taken his inspirations from well-known and respected literary or philosophical sources. But by the time he reached Ein Heldenleben and then Sinfonia Domestica in 1902, his inspiration had turned inward, where he had found a fascinating subject, himself. So the list of suitable subjects for symphonic poems now included autobiography. For Strauss, though, philosophical inspiration was never far away. Strauss went through a great deal of soul-searching after the death of his good friend Gustav Mahler in 1911, and he took solace in an 1888 essay by Friedrich Nietzsche, who had provided the literary inspiration for Also Sprach Zarathustra. The essay was called The Antichrist, or The Antichristian, and its thesis was that modern civilization had become weak through its embrace of the soft Christian values of pity and sympathy, and that it needed to reclaim its strength. Now, Strauss was not the nihilist that Nietzsche was, but he did agree with some of the book's precepts. He wrote in his diary that year that it is clear to me that the German nation will achieve new creative energy only by liberating itself from Christianity. I shall call my Alpine symphony Der Antichrist, since it represents moral purification through one's own strength, liberation through work, worship of eternal, magnificent nature." End quote. Strauss eventually left the Antichrist scenario behind, except for the worship of nature part. From that Swiss sunrise that he had described to his parents in 1901, Strauss unrolled a magnificent and detailed piece of landscape painting that anyone can enjoy without worrying about any underlying philosophical implications. Even though an Alpine symphony is performed as one continuous work, the score is divided into 22 discrete episodes which describe the journey in chronological order. Just as the adventure of the Strauss family had, this musical outing begins at night.
Although this night, in Strauss's view, is full of mystery and foreboding. The sunrise is not dissimilar to the famous one in Also Sprach Zarathustra, but without the organ. The party begins its ascent. And soon encounters a hunt in progress. Complete with offstage horns. They climb higher and higher, encountering streams and waterfalls. Meadows and pastures. They get lost along the way and wander around in the brambles. There are some dangerous moments slipping and sliding on the top of the glacier. But finally they reach the summit where the view is awe-inspiring. On the way down, the mists begin to rise. an uneasy calm is just a prelude to distant thunder. The storm begins. And it is a big one. sheets of rain. But actually, there's some exhilaration at being in the middle of such a huge storm. begins to die down. As the sun sets, night begins to settle
and the weary travelers return home wet and exhausted, but safe and sound. Although, in the end, as it was in the beginning, it's a rather somber night. An Alpine symphony uses a huge orchestra, including an offstage brass chorus for the hunt section, an organ, a wind machine, and a thunder machine. Even though he was already acknowledged as a master orchestrator, Strauss wasn't quite sure that it would all work the way he had envisioned. But at the final dress rehearsal, he remarked, at last I have learned to orchestrate. I wanted to compose for once as a cow gives milk, end quote. It's certainly an apt image for an Alpine symphony. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.